Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Okay, um, so thank you all for coming and spending your Friday afternoon with us. Um, we're very glad to have you all here again. Um, my name is Madeline Wonder, and I'm gonna be talking about total hip replacements and post-operative rehab and recovery and the implications of both the anterior and posterior approaches. Um, so just some objectives for what I'm gonna be going over today. Um, discussing differences between anterior versus total um, posterior total hip replacement, understanding the post-operative surgical precautions based upon um, the procedure, understand the differences during post-operative rehab based on whether a patient has either an anterior or, or a posterior approach, and then lastly, discussing both short-term and long-term outcomes based upon uh, the different surgeries. Uh, so just real quick about me, um, I went to Simmons for both my bachelor's and graduate degrees. Anybody else here is Simmons? I know Jane. Oh, good. A couple of Simmons people. Um, so I got my bachelor's in exercise science there and then went on to get my doctorate in physical therapy. Um, I'm a physical therapist here at Plymouth Bay Orthopedic and Sports Therapy. I've been with the company for four years now. Um, I am an impact trained physical therapist, so I um, do specialize in concussion and post-concussion uh, rehab. Um, unfortunately, for those of you who wanted to hear that today, sorry, I'm not talking about it. I'm talking about hips instead. Um, and when you won't find me in the clinic with patients, um, you'll find me on the ice. I was a figure skater for 20, 25 years, um, and I'm also a figure skater coach at the Skating Club of Boston. Um, so I took a special interest in this topic because I thought it was not a matter of if, but when, uh, with 20 plus years of figure skating, that my hip would then be replaced, if not both. Uh, so here we are. Um, so indications for total hip replacement who, who needs one? Who's a candidate for one and why? I know um, people have gone into this previously here today, so I'll kind of speed this up. Um, most commonly, it's due to osteoarthritis. You heard Dr. Zabilski talk earlier um, a lot about that, but if somebody's had osteoarthritis, you want to have them try conservative measures first. So us as physical therapists, first line of defense, um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, activity modifications, injections. Somebody's then a uh, candidate for total hip replacement if they've taken these conservative measures, they've ex basically exhausted them, and their quality of life is now not to the point where they would like it to be, so they decide and elect to have the surgery. Um, other indications as for why someone could also have a total hip replacement would be for AVN or avascular necrosis of the hip, so a lack of blood supply, particularly to the head of the femur. Um, if someone has a fracture, um, you know, an unfortunate fall or something like that where they've fractured their hip and it's the best course for them to have the joint replaced. Um, rheumatoid arthritis and or also a tumor. Um, so Dr. Sakir just went into this uh, previously, So, but just real quick, you've got the ball and socket joint. You've got the ball, which is your head of the femur, and the socket, which is your acetabulum. Um, different types of hip replacement surgery, so um, there's different approaches. The first one is anterior, which is actually on the on the right side of the screen. Dr. Sakira had this on his um, presentation as well. So that's the anterior approach, which is a minimally invasive incision on the front of the thigh or more the anterior lateral thigh. Um, next one is lateral, and this is very rare and not, I mean, I haven't seen one. Has any PT here seen a lateral approach? Yeah, okay. Um, and then most commonly what everybody I think tends to think of or tended to think of as hip replacement is your posterior incision. So that C-shaped incision right along the backside of the glute um, in and around the external rotators. Um, what we see here at Plymouth Bay Orthopedics, we were seeing posterior approaches, but now with um, Dr. Sakira coming to us in the past year, we've seen a huge influx of the anterior approach as well, um, which kind of sparked my interest too of wanting to discuss the differences between both here today. Um, okay, so anterior versus posterior approach. This is just a little um, chart that I put in. Um, so on, and on the anterior side, um, it is muscle sparing. So the incision is made on that anterior lateral thigh. Um, things are retracted, but there are no cuts to soft tissue to any, um, like in the posterior approach. So in the posterior approach, um, as most of you know, there's excision or um, soft tissue um, interruption to those hip external rotators, the, the PGOGO cues as we learned it, or I learned it in PT school um, and in through the glute area. For the anterior approach, there's no formal post-operative precautions. Um, there are a few things to just be, you know, cautious of and careful of in the immediate post-operative phase, which I'll go into a little bit later. Um, posterior approach, I would 
I think it's safe to say pretty much everybody knows in this room the, the top three um, posterior precautions. You, when I first was in school and then it originally became a PT, those precautions were kind of a hard set 12 weeks, no flexion beyond 90, internal rotation, all the things that we know. Um, and even over the past few years, it, it's been great to see those kind of you know, diminishing where now it's more on the six week side. Um, but those precautions, surgeon dependent, so, uh, depending upon who does the surgery, they may still have a different timeline for those precautions. Um, but I can speak to here at Plymouth Bay, it's, uh, it's six weeks of precautions with a lifetime precaution of combined flexion and internal rotation uh, for those who have had a posterior approach. Um, anterior, for those of you who have seen that type, it is a smaller incision um, and minimally invasive, so it is smaller in size than the posterior. Um, posterior is a larger incision, kind of right, right along the back posterior lateral uh, glute area. Um, for anterior, um, they, these patients tend to have a little more weakness of their anterior hip flexor and or quadriceps after surgery. Um, kind of, you know, makes sense in that where the incision was made and where they have to go in through and through the structures in the anterior part of the hip, that your anterior hip flexor, your psoas, your quadriceps would be the um, where you would have pro predominantly the most weakness of that area. Whereas for posterior, most of these patients have weakness of those hip extensors, hip AB doctors, because where they have to go in through that incision and excise those structures to get to the hip. Um, I would say both anterior and posterior have a very low dislocation rate. However, anterior, I would say with the lack of formal precautions, tends to have a little bit of a lower dislocation rate. However, the posterior approach is the one that's most commonly used for revisions, um, just to gain more access and uh, better um, visualization of the hip itself if something needs to be revised. So even though it is such a great surgery and one of the top three, like Dr. Sakira had mentioned a minute ago, there are, you know, with any surgery, there are complications or a chance of some complications. Um, first one would be bleeding. Um, second one, I think this is the one, you know, one of the biggest ones and biggest complications is infection. So um, making sure patients are monitoring their incision, monitoring for any signs or symptoms of infection immediately post-op after surgeries is especially important because if that um, total joint gets infected, no, nobody wants that. Uh, dislocation, this is also something that nobody wants. Um, so as long as they are following those posterior hip precautions for those six weeks and or until cleared by, by their respective surgeon, um, these tend to be avoided. Um, deep vein thrombosis or DVT. Um, most patients are on a um, blood thinner uh, after surgery, but just something else that we also discuss with patients um, preoperatively if we see them and then postoperatively just to, again, monitor for signs and symptoms of things like that. Um, nerve injury and, oops, sorry, and then also um, fracture. Rare, but it can happen. So for post-operative rehab, I wanted to take it through kind of the four stages as to what us here at um, Plymouth Bay Orthopedics, what we see in our rehab department. So for a lot of these patients, and I would say not just for hip replacements, but also knee replacements and shoulder replacements, we will see um, as many or a lot of these patients preoperatively for a pre-op visit. And I think this is extremely beneficial on many fronts and it also helps the patient um, with a lot of education and things like that beforehand because you know knowledge is power and the more a patient knows about their surgery and the process going into it, they're that much more prepared once they've come out of the OR. Um, in these pre-op visits, what we do is we it gives us the opportunity to establish a preoperative baseline. Um, we're able to measure range of motion and strength um, lower extremity muscle length, do a gait and balance assessment. Um, we do a review of their home environment. Do you have stairs to get into your house? Do you have you purchased or do you have a chair or a commode? Do you have stairs to get into your bedroom and bathroom? All things that, um, you know, have an effect on them and their post-operative process. Um, one thing that we will review with them during these preoperative visits is gait training um, on both level surfaces and stairs. So if somebody does say, oh, I have stairs to get into my house, you know, how do I do that? What's that sequencing? We'll go over that during their preoperative visit, which the patients are really appreciative and it helps them so that the first time they're not hearing it is, you know, in the hospital to be able to go home or, or once they're home. Um, we review post-operative surgical precautions, especially if they're having a posterior approach. We educate them on why they have those precautions and for how long. Um, 
we give them a preoperative home exercise program and educate them on DVT um, prevention following the surgery. And then just patient education. A lot of times they've had their other preoperative visits and then they come into us with questions that they've either forgotten to ask or haven't been able to get a chance to talk to somebody about. Um, and so it's, the patients feel really comforted when they leave here and then have um, go in for the surgery. So the next stage is obviously the acute care physical therapy in the hospital. They've had their surgery. They get up same day uh, with the PTs in the hospital. Then the patients will then transfer either to a rehab facility or be discharged to home for home services. And then they will return back to an outpatient physical therapy clinic. Usually for our patient population, after a total hip replacement, it's between weeks three and four that they'll be seen in outpatient therapy after they've had their three-week follow-up with the surgeon. So this is another slide that I put together here um, for anterior versus posterior, just in terms of things that I, as, as a therapist, have, have noticed you know, based upon the different surgical procedures and what we've been seeing in the clinic. Um, so like I had touched upon before, anterior, it's it's very common and they will tend to have weakness in their hip flexor and their quadriceps. They'll say, oh, my biggest thing is, you know, I have trouble going up the stairs, but I can I walk, no problem. I have no problem with that, my, but my biggest thing is stairs. Um, whereas posterior, they'll tend to have more weakness in their glutes, external rotators, hip abductors. So that um, type of a surgery, you'll tend to see more of that Trendelenburg gait after surgery based upon the um, weakness in those areas. Um, for the anterior, I would say they tend to have a little bit more of like a forward flexed gait, a little bit of decreased hip extension, um, whereas the posterior can tend to sometimes have more of that Trendelenburg on their operative side like I was discussing. Um, both anterior and posterior, I find sometimes have a little bit of a shortened stride length. I think some of that can tend to be from all the pain and stuff that they were in prior to surgery. Somebody's in pain, they're coming into the clinic, they have arthritis, they're not gonna stand up nice and tall and feel great. They're gonna kind of be bent forwards like this so they get tightness through that anterior hip, their quadriceps and weakness through that area. And then even once they've had the surgery, it still takes a few weeks to kind of get that um, back and normalized. Um, I would say specifically for anterior, sometimes they will have a little bit of numbness along that anterior lateral thigh um, after surgery. That is, that is normal and that will usually tend to resolve um, and improve within the first six weeks or so. That will taper down in time. So what does this mean for us? So as physical therapists, um, what does this mean for us? So for posterior, what are the precautions? Anybody? Throw it out there. Go for it. All right, I'm hearing little whisperings. No flexion beyond 90, internal rotation or adduction or crossing of the legs, okay? And the functional implications are that of that are for when patients come in, things that we um, have to be careful with or have discussed with them are, you know, bending down, tying their shoes, bending down to put their socks on, sitting in a low chair, crossing their legs after surgery or pivoting or turning on that operative side. I'll have patients come in for an eval after their total hip and I'm like, how are you doing? Great. And they sit in the chair and cross their legs and I'm like, stop. Um, but it's just the education of them as to the certain uh, things to avoid immediately in that first post-operative phase and us as PTs, how we can help to kind of maximize and benefit their mobility in that it, during that time. Um, and then for anterior approach, uh, there's no formal precautions like what we had said before. However, things to watch out for is a combined hip extension, abduction, and external rotation. So if you kind of think about what that position would look like, I'm not really sure a lot of patients are getting into that position, unless you're me, right there. Ex extension, abduction, external rotation. Um, but it is also very important for physical therapists to know the different su the surgeon and then the surgeon preferences based on whether they are anterior or posterior approach, their timeline for starting active, you know, range of motion versus more resisted um, exercises, you know, with an ankle weight or a resistance band versus body weight um, and taking that into consideration. And then the last thing that I put in here was just, it was a systematic review um, and meta-analysis that I had found. It was in the Journal of Orthopedic Surgery and Research out of 2018. And what this article did is it directly compared um, DA or direct anterior versus posterior approach in total hip. Um, and the study evaluated post-operative clinical outcomes. 
and the safety of direct anterior versus posterior. So there were nine randomized controlled trials that um, met the criteria to be included in the study. And the different outcomes that they looked at were the hip hair score at two, six, and 12 weeks and one year post-op. Um, VAS or visual analog scale at 24, 48, and 72 hours, incision length, OR time, post-op blood loss, and like the same complications. And what this uh, article found was that the uh, increased hip hair score at two and four weeks for um, direct anterior, but there was no statistical difference between the two at weeks 12 and one year. Um, so initially, the direct anterior had a little bit better overall, you know, mobility and report of how they were doing. But by months three and at 12 years, completely even, no difference between anterior versus posterior. Um, and initially, the anterior had a reduced uh, pain level uh, the first couple of days. But same thing by weeks 12 and by one year, both were completely even, and there was no statistical difference between um, either approach. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, there was a smaller incision length, which we know for the direct anterior approach, a little bit less blood loss, and then there was no difference based upon approach between OR time and or complication rates. Um, you know, and just a couple of things to note, like when I was reading this article myself, I said, okay, you know, did the anteriors do a little bit better initially because there were no formal post-operative precautions? Um, you know, or did the posteriors have a little bit more pain because it wasn't Dr. Oliver or Dr. Zabilski who did their posterior surgery? I don't know. Um, but I just thought it was a good article where at, you know, after month three and on to one year, once they've completed their rehab course, they're back to doing all the things that they want to do, completely even. And that's it. Thank you.